The dreaming or creation time is when our ancestor spirits moved across the land and created life, passed down laws and made important features in the landscape. In most stories of the dreaming, the ancestral beings came to the earth in human form and as they moved through the land, they created the animals, plants, rivers, rocks and other features of the land that we know today. They also created the relationships between Aboriginal clan groups and our relationship to the land and to the animals. Once the ancestor spirits had finished creating the world, they lost their human shapes and changed into trees, the stars, rocks, watering holes and other objects. These are the sacred places of our Aboriginal culture and have special properties. Because the ancestors did not disappear at the end of the dreaming, but remained in these sacred sites, the dreaming is never ending, linking the past and the present, the people and the land. Stories of the dreaming pass on important knowledge, cultural values and belief systems from one generation to the next. Using song, dance, painting and storytelling to express the dreaming stories, Aboriginal people have maintained a link with the old ways to the new ways of today. The first peoples called this area Caddy. It was home to the Gadigal clan. This was their homeland. Let's imagine a day in the life of a Gadigal person. How did the people live with the land? You've got to remember that every day was different. It was really dependent on what the weather was like, the time of the day, the season. Like all Aboriginal clan groups across Australia, whether it was in the older days or even today, people moved. They had their summer homelands and winter homelands and they would move across their tribal boundaries. So if it was cold down by the harbour, they would move to the warmer caves and rock shelters and further into the forest for the seasonal crops. As they moved, they were able to navigate where they were going by looking at the stars. They could read the land. The land was part of them. The sun would tell them what the time was and what season it was. They could read the environment for food, water and shelter. So they would know when a particular waddle turned a colour, it was time to move inland. Tracks or markings in the sand would tell them what sort of animals were living there. A lot of the food came from the harbour. The waters of Sydney Harbour were the women's domain. They provided most of the food for their families. The Gadigal women had amazing skills in fishing, swimming, diving and canoeing. Every day in all types of weather, and often at night too, women would be out in little bark canoes called nawis. They would manage these canoes with small children, even babies, where they would tackle fish through rough surf. They would have little fires in their canoes lit on clay pads for keeping warm and for cooking, and they would sing to each other to keep time when paddling. Nothing would go to waste. If you killed an animal, everything would be used. So the Gadigal would go back to Jubagali, where they'd been eating those oysters and other shellfish and chucking them into a pile. And they would collect the shells and fashion them into sharp tools like hooks and axes. Gadigal men used shells to make the barb for their spears for hunting across the grasslands. 